if you're gonna sign an agreement, don't ask your friend, cousin, auntie, somebody <laughs> like, oh, could you read this over for right. me? You go find a lawyer somewhere. Try to let them work with you. Make sure like you're actually protected and covered, especially for people in music, that you're not signing away all your copyright, right. all your publishing, mm -hmm. and you don't know. And then years later, you're wondering, uh, how come I have all these hits and I'm not making any money? Right. All right, guys, we're back for part two. And we want to say thanks to everyone who um, are here and made it early. And we do apologize for the little late start. Okay. Um, there are some questions that were not answered from the previous, um, from part one. And um, my first question is actually going to go directly to Dr. Martin. And uh, that question is... Uh, um, can you hear me, Dr. Martin? I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I can hear you. all right. So, one of the questions that we didn't get answered, didn't ask, sorry, which would be um, with COVID that is happening. Do you think that is why is that co um, government should give filmmakers assistance um, at this time? And uh, whatever, and if yes or no, why? Um. I think government should offer assistance to self-employed businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, which filmmakers, if properly registered and um, tax compliant, will fall into that category. Um, especially if you have people that you employ, people that you are financially responsible for, if you contribute uh, to the economy like everybody else, you should have the same access. I know in St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, as a part of their stimulus plan, they did make provisions for self-employed individuals. Well, one of the things that needed to be those individuals and businesses had to be compliant. What that means, they would have had to be paying their social security and up to date in that way. Unfortunately, some companies, especially small businesses, don't tend to always be tax compliant and up to date with certain streams of payments, which is problematic. And even medium-sized business, they, they don't file financials, they don't inland revenue, and that might prevent them from getting assistance. Uh, but government should provide assistance to whoever um, needs it once they're able to qualify and are eligible. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to ask Mr. Vaughn. Um, Vaughn is one of our new guests that we have. And I'm going to ask him to give us um, an overview of who he is and also the company that he's also representing. Hi, how are you, everybody? Um, I've been in advertising and creative industry for years. Um, I'm right now the Antigua Director for Echo. So that's mainly what I'm representing. For who? Eastern Caribbean Corporate Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Okay. And um, Vaughn, if you can give us um, more details about um, about filmmakers, the music, and um, also, um, is there a fee that one should pay every month or every... What is ex exactly... Um, how it works, how does Echo works itself? Okay, um, what Echo does, Echo collects um, copyright royalties on behalf of their members, which would be oh. songwriters and composers. Nice. Um, in reference to new movies, well, you know, what we would cover is the music in the movies. Um, we don't really give out licenses for music in movies, but what we'll do, we'll, we'll collect licenses from cable companies, cinemas, anywhere that the movies are played or broadcast publicly. And, um, so we collect the royalties on the music. Okay, so can I jump in with a question? Uh, because you're speaking my language. Uh, well, not in these things. No idea how it works there. But it was like you are doing the version of what's in the U.S. to be ASCAP and BMI, CSAC, and, um, in Canada, still can which are these 
performing rights organization and they collect the public performance royalties. So you said the verb in the Caribbean is echo? Uh, in the Caribbean, the Eastern Caribbean is echo. In the Eastern Caribbean. <laughs> okay, so. And, um, Bobby mm -hmm. is Cosca, Jamaica is Jamaica. Okay. Okay, so uh, we were talking about pretty much what the, the Les Antilles type deal island. How many nation islands are part of Echo? Echo, um, I think nine. Okay, so like Antigua, St. Kitts, Nevis. St. Kitts, St. Lucia, okay. um, Dominica, St. Vincent, basically the OECS. Except okay. Okay, so that's what I was trying to get at. Oh, okay, that's cool because I have no idea about that. Like, I know how it works here. But um, uh, it was Echo was the solution society, right? Okay. And they got the mandate from PRS, who was you know collecting on behalf of Britain to try okay. and cover the East Eastern Caribbean because you can okay. imagine what it does for PRS to cover down here. Okay, oh, yeah, that's I, I totally get it because even with um, the PROs up here which is BMI, CSAC, and ASCAP are the biggest three. Mm -hmm. When they do international royalties collection, they have these agreements with other like international arms. So they'll have an agreement with a PR in Europe and different parts of the world, and they'll collect royalties on behalf of the American artists that are signed with ASCAP or BMI or CSAC and then send the royalties to the U.S., and then the U.S. does the vi vice versa. When their artist songs are played in the U.S., they collect and then send to that performing rights organization in, uh, yeah, in other parts of the world. So I get it. It's the public performance you collect, yeah, we're, we're the public performance royalties. All the organizations are basically one on the white board. So we all have an agreement where we work with each other. So mm -hmm. once you're performing right society, you work with each other because yeah, you collect yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So Mike, um, I have a question for you, Vaughn, right? Um, it was asked in our last, um, in our first recordings. The question for you is, we're offline, sorry. It was offline, really. And if I, WTO, explain the rulings of the WTO where Antigua, can use American music freely. I think that is what is said in the ruling. So does that work with Echo? Explain. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what's, what's, what's ruling, but we cannot use private copyright. So what yeah. is between governments is between governments. So we can't go and grab somebody's private copyright because they're from the States. That's, we can't do that. No, you will get sued, oh, so and I can jump in on the U.S. arm for that. What no, there is no such thing. There, um, I'm, I'm going to jump in a little bit on that because there's no such thing as an international copyright um, that blankets the entire world. And I can copyright, I'm telling you, you don't use American co I can copyright the way how it's set up. Um, is one of the most like extensive in terms of duration and how it lasts and how it's acquired, right? In America, so I think I said in the last, I don't know if I said it the last time, but anyway, I'll say it here. In America, how copyright is obtained is that it's automatic, especially in music. It's completely automatic. So when you, when you write your lyrics on a paper or type it up, you automatically get copyright. When you go into the studio and you record anything, you don't even have to even be in the studio. You could like literally hold your phone and press voice record and record that and you're singing. That sound recording just got instant copyright protection. And that protection in the United States lasts for the life of the author, the person who created it, plus 70 years. And What's in America, movie? go on. Isn't it going up 99 years? No, so, no, 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 it's, okay, so there are two different type of copyright, well, there are multiple copyright durations, we're not even going there, okay, but I'll tell you what, like, the, the persistent one is, right, so, it's life of the author plus 70 years, that's the, that's, like, the base point, if it's a work for hire, this is probably where you're getting that 90-something year or something, if it's a work for hire, it's 95 years if it's a work for hire. So if I go to a composer, because I'm working on a project, I'm working on a film project, and I need my project scored, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I can 
commission that composer to create the music to score my film. That and that will be considered a work for hire because I am trying to capture the copyrights. Because in America, how it works, copyright goes to the person who creates the work unless there's an agreement to the contrary at the time of the creation. Or else afterwards, you just got to transfer it, right? So if I'm scoring a film, I could go to a composer and say, hey, composer, I am doing this film. I need a score. I'm going to commission you to make this score. When that happens, I become the author for copyright purposes, but the duration of the copyright will only be 95 years because it's a work for hire. The government here only gives an author this really extensive uh, individual, right? Mm -hmm. The one that's creating the work, an individual, because if you work as an employee, your work is still going to be 95 years because your copyright transfers to your employer. But as an author, like as an individual, they give you like that extra copyright, you know, oomph here in the US. So if you create a piece of work as an author, an individual, you will get copyright for your life plus 70 years. So the example I like to give in music is a client that I have right now that I've been managing their music estate for, I don't know, like going on five, five or six years. I can't remember. Time flies, right? But it's been a minute. And what happened is that her husband died. And when her husband died, he left her a portion of the copyright he owned, which is a 50% in a music publishing company that he had started with his friend. And he had written a bunch of hits, like about five or six hits, well, more than that, from the 90s. But his hits came in early 90s when he created this music. So he died, okay? So the copyright still hasn't started to run yet because how it works in the US is that if you have multiple authors on a piece of work, the copyright duration doesn't kick in in terms of when it starts to run to expire until the last person dies. So on her husband's catalog, his co-partner, his co-writer is still alive and kicking. And I think the guy is 60. So if that guy lives for another 20 years, the copyright doesn't start to run on the songs they wrote together until 20 near years from now. And so in 20 years, the copyright duration was start run and you tax 70 years on top of that going forward. However, uh, their biggest hit, and it's been remixed ad nauseum. I don't even know how many times now. Probably like 50 times. Every time it's remixed, a new copyright is created in that new creation, because it's a new creation. So every time it's remixed, it's a new copyright, okay? And then every time that happens, the song is going to always live on in some version for like over a hundred years. Because every time it gets remixed, say a 20 something year old remix their original hit, okay? That copyright on that one doesn't start to run until those people die off of the remix. You get what I'm saying, how it works here? So it will just keep going and going and going. Music does that a lot, not so much in film, because film is a different beast in how film is created. But in music, copyright tends to just go on forever and a day, especially in rap music, because there'll be 20 people on a song, right? Everybody's dropping a bar, everybody's an author. And you like, think about Little Nas X and Old Town Road and how many versions of Old Town Road. And the kid is like 21, right? So if he lives for another 60 years, Okay, like the copyright wouldn't start to run. Well, on the original where it's just by him. But you think he did it with that little yodeling kid, right? And yodeling kid is like, like 11. Okay, so if the yodeling kid lives until like he's 80, you get what I'm saying? That version of the song is still going to be protected by copyright until like the kid dies maybe another 70 years from now. So you can see how the power of copyright in music just tends to join and go in film, but in music. And I see the flow to you again now there. I just wanted to make that clear for you guys. So I this great works here in the where everybody aspires to come to you because they're like the entertainment mecca, right? 
Yeah, I see because the yeah. reason why I asked that, right? Because the whole WTO ruling that happened years ago, it was Antigua's, well, Antigua won. And it was something about having with the music that we can use here. So I always wondered, how does that work? With also with I echo, something, yeah, 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 with the double trademark stuff like that. And I'll but at the end of the day, there's an international copyright treaty called the Berne Convention. I think Antigua is a, a signing, yeah. a signing to that treaty, right? Yeah. That treaty kind of governs how the international copyright plays out. And uh, yeah, trust me, you can't pick up American artist music and just go use them. You will get some kind of cease and desist letter. I, I, think, here. I, I think it might be on um, U.S. government-owned copyrights, because U.S. government has several copyrights. Yeah, but the government here can't really own copyright. Like, the U.S. government can't technically own copyrights. Trademarks. That's what I said, trademarks. It, um, yeah, trademarks, not copyright, but trademarks. Okay, so trademark. All right. Vaughn, here's another question for you, okay? Um, what, it, explain, to, explain to me how a filmmaker... Um, can use Echo for their benefit and um, without, let's say, okay, for example, um, you know, somebody that may just want to do a little shot with their phone or the camera, they don't have all the bells and the whistles, but they just want to use a little music, say, from um, somebody from St. Lucia, from Trinidad, or things like that. Can they, and, but they don't have the money I don't know what I'm, I'm right now. I'm just going to pretend as if I don't know the cost of echo if, of the charges. But what if a person decided they want to use a song from Marsha Montana on the film? Well, um, what they would have to do is have, they would have to actually seek permission from Marsha Montana because that becomes a moral right. Um, so they actually have to seek permission from him. We can assist in helping you find out who the copyright holder is, and sometimes we can communicate with the copyright holders or their agents and actually get your price. Because Echo, with, uh, Echo, before I became the director of Echo, they have done that for me before because I do commercials. Um, but they cannot, they will not directly give you permission to do it. They can make the contact for you when they give you a charge. But um, to use somebody's music in your film, unless it's like up there for, um, you know, for that purpose, sometimes there is a moral right involved, so you actually have to ask the person's permission. Where we see that coming is with the Trump rallies, where people have been sending cease and desist letters. Because you have a right to say where your music is represented. You know what I'm saying? Because imagine you have a gospel, a nice gospel song, but it just works. You see, it appears in a porn film. You lose your mind. So you, it is, we don't give permission for that because they're, they're, you know, they're, um, they're moral rights. So you, can, so you actually have to get in touch with Marshall or whoever the, um, the copyright holder is. And if you're using a Marshall song, it's not just copyright, it's also performance right, because you're also be using his performance, mm. which is two different rights. Mm. Okay, so you know the popular thing that happens, you know, in the Caribbean that could be for theater, um, or you know, whatever stage play or something, and you know, we just, oh, let's, let me play this particular person's song. So even in that, we still have to go and seek permission from the artist itself. Well, you should, but um, really and truly, okay, you should, absolutely should, but lots of people don't because if you have a, if you do, even if you're doing a movie and it's a small movie, it's not worth it to sue you for that. Unless it's something that really offends, it's not really worth it. I mean, if, you, if they start making money, then sure, they're going to come and knocking on your door. But if it's, it's not worth it, like plus sometimes you might even um, request uh, permission or license to use a sample in your music. When you communicate with the rights holder and then they find out that you're printing 200 CDs, they don't even respond to you at that point. So unless it's worth it, they're not going to do anything. But by all rights, yes, of course you should seek permission. If you just play music in the background of your play, so like during intermission there's music, then we um, Echo will provide a license for that. Because oh, so we have to come and ask for permission. We, we have to come and ask for no, permission. No. Oh, okay. You have to get a license. So if you just play music, if you just play music in the background or at intermission at your play, 
then that's a public broadcast of music and you'll have to seek a license before you do that. The rate of the license will be much less than somebody who's having a concert because the music is not the main purpose of your play. It's just in the background. But for music appearing as a part of your performance, um, yes, you really should, I know we'll also collect money for that. We'll also collect a license for that. But really, yes, you should get permission from the persons who own the music. But if you have a small play, I don't think it'll be a big deal. But we should. But we should. Okay. Yeah. All question, right. question for you, Vaughn, if, if, if y'all don't mind me jumping to. Sure, go ahead. Uh, my name is Penny. All right, so Vaughn, a uh, question for you. When it comes to local bars and restaurants and so forth that are playing music, how do you treat that? Uh, we charge a tariff or a yearly license based on your CD. Once again, these are very small amounts because the main area of your, uh, of your business is not music. If you're doing a concert, then we charge 5% you gain, um, and like, like a one-time concert. But if you have a business that is continual, we give you a yearly license, and the uh, cost is not as much as maybe even like a, a yearly license that we give to a radio station. But everything from hotel bars to, um, if you have a business, any kind of business, supermarket, and there's music being played, copyrighted music being played, you should get a license for that. Oh, sorry. I had a question. Did you just say 5% of the gate proceeds? Yeah, for, um... And then, and then the DJ and the artists have to give you, like, a track list. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, track list, yeah. And then you determine, then you distribute. So how, how, like, I've always wondered what's the cost of Echo every time, let's say a concert, let's say there's a Vibes Cartel song, uh, we use Marshall, so stick with Marshall. Marshall song played five times. How... How <laughs> how much is it per song? I'm trying to figure out. Especially, and let's say Marshall is the artist at the concert. You're gonna still charge me to use his music? Um, we don't charge for the performance. We charge for the owner of the copyright, who is the author and composer. So this is songs. Okay, okay. Okay. So the copyright goes to the author and composer. Okay. Uh, you have a concert. There are two different uh, we can talk about performance rights and copyright. Copyright is in the creation of not necessarily LD says that is right. Even if you record a song on a, on your phone for reference or write it down, then that is a copyright. That is the creation of the song. And that is copyright, and that's what we collect. So if you use somebody's song in a concert, then the, per then the person sings the song, you know, they get paid from the person having the concert. But the person who created the song, whose property you're using, we collect the license for that. But, but I, I'm trying to understand because this, I think, is what artists have an issue with echo. There seems to be a general lack of transparency in how you build. 5% seems extremely broad for you to just charge without knowing how often a song is played, even if the artist is in fact that composer, uh, uh, you know, uh, owner of the copyright on the songs, all these different components. I, I know there've been some contention in saying it's when it comes to the collecting, collection of these fees, because that seems significantly high. And what if when you do your tally at the end of the night for this one concert, there's money left over? Like that seems, that seems high. I mean, Companies like Spotify, Pandora, they, they have a fixed amount that they pay every time a song is streamed. So why Echo don't move to that type of model instead of a flat fee? That seems excessive. Well, okay. um, what we... we, Go we don't no, when you're done, I'm going to jump in and do a, a thing here. We charge a percentage of the gate. So basically, we charge a percentage of how much the music is consumed. We do take playlists if, the, if it's over a certain amount. If the, if the fee is over a certain amount, we will take a playlist so we'll know exactly how much times each song is played. And lots of DJs in the region um, with the OECS because copyright is, I don't want to use the word new, but lots of promoters are now understanding copyright and now being charged for copyright. They kind of, there's a lot of misunderstanding. So mm -hmm. we take a percentage of the gate, 5%. And if you consider this, if you're having a concert, the main product you sell is music. 
Not bears, not alcohol, is music. Because you have the bears and alcohol and no music, nobody turns up. So the main product you sell is music. So let's just say 5% of your cost is for the main product you sell, that's, that's a steal. Yeah, but it's, it's, if this is a function of copyright, then I understand that you know, people have to be cons- com- compensated for their work, but 5% is a flat fee. So if, for example, I have a, a concert and I only play Marshall, or I play an artist, and that artist owns all the rights to his songs, I'm paying him to perform, then why am I paying you 5%? Because, it doesn't make sense. Because there are two different roles. There's a role of an artist and the role of a writer. As a writer, I'm saying, assume that the artist is the writer and composer. Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. You As know what, guys? Do you guys want me to jump into kind of broker this thing yeah. that's going on? Maybe I'll bring some clarity here. Okay. I hear what you're saying because I understand how the BMI works here. So what I'm, and I'm interjecting here, just so you guys don't keep going back and forth and try to clear up and bring some clarity. All right. So let me tell you a parallel of how it's working here. Generally in the US, right? All performance. Okay. So let's go back to songs and how they work. And I'll use the US example and this might shed lights on how it's working in the Caribbean, which is similar. It might call it a little different, but it's pretty much similar. So generally, what Vaughn is saying, right, Terrence, is that a song, there are levels, okay? You have in, whether you, I'll use the US copyright um, example. In the US, copyright is not considered a single right, but a bundle of rights. And here we call them sticks in the bundle. They're a bundle of rights that can be parceled off and distributed to various people, right? So, for instance, you have the public performance right the display right, the reproduction right, and there are varying different, and there are several more rights. We're not going to go there. But there are different rights in the copyright itself that give different people different things to do. So when you have a concert, which is, this is why they're collecting the way they are. When you have a concert, right, you have the public performance right that's happening, and then you pretty much have, like, what they're calling, like, a display right, so to speak. So when the art, if an artist shows up at a concert and he's, that artist is singing their own song, you're going to pay them a performance fee because they're actually working and singing their songs. But however, they're signed here in the U.S. to BMI or ASCAP or CSAC and they're collecting the public performance royalties, which is the royalty stream that's going to writers and the composer, and the writer, so the song has two pieces, right? The lyrics and the musical component. When an artist does all of it, it's boon for them because they keep money in their pocket. In the US, there's not a performance royalty, okay? Performers, as an artist singer, you only get paid, say, if the song is sold. You don't get paid when the song is played. All right, you have to understand that music, how music gets paid is very complex, which then trips a lot of people up because the artists themselves, unless they write the underlying work for the song, they don't see royalties from public performance because there's no performance royalty, right? There's not like a singer performance royalty. There's a public performance that goes to the underlying work, which is why... L saying, yeah, if there's a concert, we still collect on the copyright the underlying work, even though the artist is one of the same. That means that artist is making out like a bandit, because most artists sometimes don't actually write their own music. So it's not that they could just be cherry picking and say, well, because you are an artist that all also are like creative enough to write your own stuff, you're not going to get that royalty. It doesn't work like that. No, I, I completely understand that. So and that's I, how that works. I just want to know how Echo came to the 5% because I've always found this okay. curious and I know promoters have an issue with it. Um, even artists say, yeah, you're charging all this, but we don't see that kind of return uh-huh. after everything is settled. It just seems arbitrary. Oh, it, yeah, we're going to just charge 5%. Well, what's it on the regional, a regional rate. Um, it's the four organizations, which is 
Trinidad, Barbados, Eastern Caribbean, Jamaica, plus South America, the South American organizations, they have come up on this regional rate. And it's with lots of study, years before I was a director, it came up with a regional rate. And once again, remember, this is just for concerts where the main thing is music and 5% of your cost for your main attraction okay. is really reasonable. Makes sense. Really reasonable. Yes, I understand that you're not accustomed to paying it, even though you should don't get married for few years as a promoter in, anti in, the Caribbean, in the Eastern Caribbean, but they pay it in Trinidad, they pay it in Barbados, they pay it in Jamaica. You see, but you we also have the entertainment tax, no? Pardon me? Isn't there entertainment tax in Antigua? Yeah, but that and goes to the government. That does not go I understand that, but you got to look at it. I, I guess a question to Francois, when, when you have all these, these fees and then you have these government taxes, plus you have all the other taxes associated with promotions, what's the incentive for promoters to be innovative in the marketplace? That's a real question that should be asked. Well, let me, let me just say this. As a business, your cost goes on to the audience. So if you tell your audience, instead of $100, your ticket is 105 I don't see them complaining. Your costs go directly to the consumer. That's the, that's the idea of copyright. The consumer pays the cost. That's why we take a percentage of ticket sales. So we know how many consumers are there. So we take 5% for each consumer. <clears throat> I get it. That's, a, that's an interesting way. So tell me something. When you collect from restaurants, just mm -hmm. generally, because here I know ASCAP and BMI, what they do, they provide a restaurant so anyone else who wants to play music on their and if whether or not you need a license to play music here in the u.s and restaurants in different places it depends because there's a like a leeway in the law say if you have like a single speaker and it's this much square feet and yada yada we're not getting there we're just saying if you generally have a regular standard size restaurant they'll provide what's called a blanket license and that blanket license allow you to place in their catalog, in their repertoire of artists they represent, BMI and ASCAP. And what would happen is that in order for them to collect like the public performance royalties, they have some kind of secret formula they figure out. But what they do, they do these surveys to check and see what actually is being spun because then when money come in, it, come in they have to decide who like which artists in their repertoire actually songs were being spun so they could then divvy out the royalties to them. So I think in that sense, they go and the restaurants have to submit certain data to them. And from that data, they figure out who artists gets paid. So is, does Echo do something similar for restaurants and bars? Or don't you guys cover that under like a blanket license? I'm yes, curious. Please. Blanket license for restaurants and bars, but yeah, as I said, it's based on their seating, so the a number of people consuming the music. Um, for a restaurant with a you know, a, as I said, a middle sized restaurant that might be as low as $150 for the entire year. For the yeah, for the right. blanket license to yeah. use it for the year, okay. So it's something it's similar, mm -hmm. it makes sense for the final music. So yeah. you can get a general appreciation of what is played because we have so many other avenues where we check of what's popular, what's being played, from okay. great things to lots of different things. And especially now great, we can we use technology. Okay. And so how do you div it up among your artists when uh, when fees come in? Of course. Do you do like a survey scan to know what actually is being played or or your restaurant yeah. submitted we, a, a sheet? A we sheet. Use a service. There's a, there's an electronic service that we sign into that covers okay. uh, all the radio stations. Then of course we take the Anything from over $2,000, we're going to take playlists. So they okay. can put it in the computer program and kind of average it. If oh, you don't pay a certain amount of times, um, then you will just probably get like a minimum fee. Because okay. you can imagine, if, if somebody, let's say a concert, and the concert pays $2,000, mm -hmm. they can pay thousands and thousands of songs that night. Thousands of songs, because especially when you're paying 30 seconds a song. Thousands and thousands of songs. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's, one cents, two cents, three cents per song. Gotcha. Yeah. So unless you really sense. start getting your music out there, then you need yeah. to it's the same thing here. So it's the same artists, thing here. When mm -hmm. artists in um, the Caribbean, they can say, well, we're not seeing the returns. That's because your music is not out there. 
If your That's music true. is in your country and every promoter is fighting his fee, we're not collecting where your music is being paid. You mm -hmm. get something, a little thing, um, because we made a payout for the mm -hmm. COVID season. Um, and we also included stimulus in it. Um, to all cool. them. But unless your music is being played, and also we collect for everybody. Um, when you said that the music in their repertoire, their repertoire includes the whole world. Same as ours. So when lots of Jamaican music is being played and American music is being played and some British music, a lot of the royalties is going out. The hope of Echo is in giving, getting artists paid, and not artists, but getting songwriters paid. You will give them motivation to continue working. Not only that, mm -hmm. but if songwriters paid, you get a lot of people who cannot sing but can really write well actually giving other people their songs. Instead yeah. of the Caribbean where there are lots of really great songs sung by parties because they want to make money off their songs. Gotcha. So we're trying to that help makes sense. we're trying to help the mm -hmm. as much as possible. And look at Barbados, look at Trinidad, look at Jamaica. That, they have had copyright for years and years. And look at the level of their music. Said so Lucia This is true. Music. They get nominated for Grammys over here, the Jamaican artists. I see that. I'm a member of Academy, so I see that all the time. That's great. Yeah, that's cool. You guys are on the right track with that. I mean, it's going to be growing pains. Not everybody's going to like it, but that's the way it has to be if you want to play at this level, because trust me, in America, you think they could say that? And it's the same way. <laughs> and the fees get crazier here. I mean, for a popular song in a 30-second commercial, I used to see, like, $250,000 licensing fee, and you're playing, like, 10 seconds of the song. Amazing, but hey. If you want to play with the big boys, you got to start putting in some things. It's growing pains. They'll get over it. It's because it's new. Because the question that I have, so for example, sure. if I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm working with um, Dr. Noel Howell and Lawson. We were working on a film and, uh, and in the script, it might be a, um, a chorus for, let's say, maybe Tian Winter or, um, you know, somebody else. Should we, well, should it be the writer of the script come to you echo to say hey we are putting in this person's this person um song in this in the script itself i'm i'm how i'm asking my question asking as if i don't know i'm that's how i'm going to ask because i want the grassroots level person to understand the meaning of why we have to be um be with you um echo we can you can and i said we can assist you with that and sometimes it can be to the level where we say, okay, this will be the cost. But um, the best thing to do is to find out from Tian, right? Tian, who is the owner of the song, you go to Tian. Because you might do that from Echo. Uh, we, it might take us literally five, six months to get it done. Um, that is not our fault. We contact the company. But most of these companies have a lot of, you know, a lot of artists, lots of places to go. It's a long way to search through to find anybody. Um, and by the time your song is... Your movie is ready. See, I might say, well, I'm sorry. I signed an exclusive deal for something else with that same song. So the best thing to do is go to the, the rights owners and find out what's the situation with the song. Find out if they're okay. You know, let them know what the script is. And find out if they're okay with this song being the, in, in the movie. And that's, that is actually the best thing to do. We can assist with that. But the best thing to do is actually go to the rights owners. Okay. Is there a difference between copyright in a song versus copyright in a recording? The copyright in the songs in the Versus song, in copyright the in a recording, yeah. yeah. That's copyright. The copyright in the recording is called a performance right. Um, the way performance rights work here, and we don't charge for performance rights yet. They do in other territories here, but we don't do it yet. But what it, how that works is the performance of the song that the person does in the studio, there is a royalty on that. So the singer gets the royalty. Um, the, anybody who plays on it, plays pianos, plays any instrument on it, they get the royalty because every time you hear that recording, you're hearing their performance. So it's not, it's a, cop, it's a part of the copyright bundle, but it's a performance right. It's not necessarily a copyright. That is in the, the performance. So if, that's why on a live performance, the artist wouldn't get paid back. But the copyright will be paid in a live performance. But on a recorded performance, then there's a performance right for the person's voice and there's a copyright for the application. Okay, I'm gonna jump in just to, and I know you're using the term synonymously, 
but um, just to give a little more, more clarity so you get it, like, completely straight. So, again, with the bundle, when everything is copyright, right, that's the, the benchmark. Like, the copyright is just a general term in the way how the U.S. works, right? It's, like, the general term. And I think, like, pretty much internationally, it's the same thing. It's a bundle of rights, and it's called a copyright. And then there are different types of rights in that bundle. So when you were asking about the sound recording and the actual on the line where it's the song, and so when we're talking about the song, we're talking about the musical composition and the lyrics together, okay? Music gets crazy when it comes to semantics, like with the terms, and then people get lost in, like, and then get lost in confusing days. A producer and a producer. <laughs> and like everybody just get dazed and confused when it comes to music. I have these strategy sessions with people all the time and they're dazed and confused and don't know how they get paid. So I totally get it. So the song is when you're saying song, Francois, you're thinking about, think about the on the line work, the lyrics and the music that makes up the sound recording. And then the sound recording is what an artist goes and perform and sing, and that's the sound recording, okay? So what he was talking about, the performance, right? It's still a copyright, but most, like in Europe, they, I think Europe pays a performance right. The performance right is the right to perform, when the song is performed by the artist, so they get a royalty. And then what Echo is collecting is the public performance. It gets crazy, but they're collecting the public performance in the on the lion work, okay, for the lyrics and the music. Not not the not the so it get again it gets crazy because people don't necessarily separate them out, but for royalty purposes, you separate them out. So they're not collecting because the artist per se is singing. They're collecting the public performance because their artist who is signed to echo the songwriters, who is the lyricist and the composer, actually wrote that piece. So that's why they're, they're collecting the public performance of the on the line work. They don't collect the performance, the performance, the um, performance words he's in the person actually singing for that person singing the song. So the money is not going to the labels, okay? The record labels don't get that money. The echo is collected. Echo is collected to give to the songwriters, who's the lyricist and the composer, pretty but, much, uh, right? That's what you do. And we are the only um, organization in the Caribbean right now that mm -hmm. doesn't collect performance rights. The rest do. So we are. Okay, so okay. But the rest. Do. All right. All right, so the rest of them are collecting. They're like Europe. They collect for the artist itself, the artist that's singing the song. They collect for yeah. Yeah, US, the U.S. doesn't collect for, I mean, they've been trying, they've been trying, but mm -hmm. the radio, the radio stations have been pushing back the National Broadcasters Association because they're already paying royalties to the on-the-line work, to the writer and the composer. So their whole thing is that that's an additional royalty they would have to pay, just imagine, right? Because when you have a hit song, that artist is on the radio all the time, so the ra it's, you know, it's economics. The readers are like, are you kidding me? We're already paying so much money in royalties to the songwriters. Now you're going to have us want to pay royalty to the artists. That bill has been dead on the arrival in the United States for years now. It That's a shame. That's a shame. That's, still shame. There. That's a shame. Dr. Martin got the question answered um, from Vaughn with regard to tickets. Um, I was just curious. And I think El Doni, I'm going to call him as Mason because I struggle with it. <laughs> yeah. It's my first name. Yes, please. <laughs> the 5% flat fee is what it is. I'm just concerned how it's divvied up on the back end. I, I, I think guess. that's what people struggle with because that this doesn't seem to be a clear, understandable algorithm for the distribution of the funds on the back end. So I am well aware that cost is passed on to consumers completely aware this is my area um but it's the understanding of how echo works and for echo to be adapted it, there needs to be a strong education and awareness campaign on a regional basis and um continue doing what they're doing that that's that's it right. but well, uh, note, though, let, let me just say this 
there's a, there's a max price that a consumer is willing to pay, right? Especially in hard times, hard economic times like these. So we can't just always assume costs will have to be passed on to the consumer. I think what you're gonna see, especially as people are out of work, et cetera, the promoter and the business is going to eat some of that cost. So you have to be cognizant of that. We, we are well aware, but um, as I said, it's a business. So, okay, let's say you have a fair. Um, you, you don't go to your alcohol distribution and say, I'm not paying that much because I don't know how much money it's going to make. It's, it's a, Actually, actually you do. You, you go to your alcohol distributor and you pay on consignment. You pay based on what you use. So same thing with Echo. So you pay, you pay based on your ticket sales. So if you sell one ticket, you pay 5% of one ticket. If you sell a but that's not the same thing. Uh, Echo is not paying based on what you use. Echo is paying yes, based yeah. on ju- growth it's revenue. It's no. no. But the gross I'm revenue, not going to go do this back and forth. Um, no, but isn't your ticket sale? So the less people you sell to, the less we charge. The more people you sell to, the more we charge. That's what we charge the percentage. If you okay. sell one ticket for $100, we charge you $5. If you sell 1,000 tickets, we charge you 50 Okay, I'm going to say these two guys here is going to be like, go on the debate team and debate each other afterwards. would be awesome. I could totally be mediated. I could be mediating your conversation. No, it's not a debate. I, I think, I think what, I think Vaughn, I think what Vaughn needs to realize is that um, this is so new. And as you say, it's going to be growing pains that mm-hmm. there needs to be open transparency when it comes to how people operate. And I think there's a general consensus that people don't know what, how Echo operates. The fact okay. that you're in this space and you're just knowing what Echo is, is an example of that yeah, everybody doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, right? I, so, I didn't know. I'm not even gonna lie. It's like the first time I've heard about it, but it's not like you keep up on Caribbean copyright. So. Exactly, you're not in this, and you're not a remoter. Really? No, I don't keep up on... No, I know everything about the American stuff, which is what I need to know, because that's how I make my money. Um, <laughs> it's not for the general person. It's for those music users. Yeah, um, but I, I get what... I'm playing devil's advocate. I get what Terrence is saying, because I think what he's saying, and it's true. Like, if you want people to buy in, you need to educate them, because if you want the buy-in of not only the artist community, but the promoter community and everyone. Yes, we get the 5% flat fee, but I think on the artist side, which this happens up here with Spotify, they do argue about this sometimes, it's how much do you actually get paid? For a lot of years, Spotify, and still now, was taking flat over how they figure out how much they paid per stream and who gets paid because you would have some artists who have like the biggest hits and say, yeah, I got like you know, say a billion streams and got $10,000 or something. So I think what he's saying is that because it's new, if you really want that public buy-in, you would have to be transparent to tell them, hey, yes, we charge us 5%, 5% is passing on to computer consumers. But then how you were saying about you're trying to get the songwriters paid so they could then move, you know, like, people would want to create songs and then you will then create this vibrant community in the OCES. It's kind of rival like the Jamaican artists where, yes, we're not just about, we're about putting out great music, you know, songs that with lyrics that make sense and people who could actually sing because the songwriters are not trying to sing their stuff to make money. I think you have to come with that selling point and then you tell them, this is how you get paid. Like, this is how we figure out how the money gets paid once we collect it. And I think when you do all that, then you have now your towards a public buy-in because now people will be like, okay, yeah, it makes sense. And it's creating jobs for people too. So, One of the problems in the Caribbean is we call meetings, we invite promoters, but once they hear it's something that you'll have to pay, they don't come. Yeah, and so then- the public the, get education. They do not come. We've done that for 10 years, right? They don't come. And then the misinformation goes out like crazy because they do not want to think. There's a lot of misinformation going on. They've been saying, oh, DJs have been saying, oh, I'm not playing local songs if I have to pay Echo. And we have to explain, it doesn't matter. Once you're playing copyrighted music, you have to pay Echo. But they refuse to understand that. They refuse to acknowledge it because they they don't really want to hear anything that says they have to pay. So they don't really want it. We've been educating them. We've been putting out information. We've been inviting them to sit down and talk. Not until legal action comes in 
That's mm -hmm. when they start wanting to talk. And then they come into the meeting with all these preconceived notions that we spent 10 years trying to educate them against. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. <laughs> That's our people, brother. That's our people. <laughs> I have been a director of Echo for maybe a few months now, but I've been with Echo, when well, I working with Echo for years. So I understand exactly what it is. And even, if, even our artists, the members of Echo, you, you invite them to a free general meeting, we'll provide lunch, one shot. So we try to educate them, but they don't want to know. We try to explain to them that even though you sign up with Echo, you still have to put in the work. You still have to get your music out there for you to get paid. They don't want to know. They think once you sign up with Echo, once you sign up for copyrights, you're supposed to get paid. You're supposed to make millions of dollars. Yeah, it don't work like that. It yeah. doesn't even work like that. <laughs> okay. and even with things on Spotify, they will take a percentage of the um, of the music, they, of the money they put in, and gen and give pay to the artist. And if billions of songs are being played on Spotify, then that has to be divided among billions of songs. It turns to be a little bit of money for each. And they have to look at the expenses. They have to look at how much it costs to advertise their program. They, they, um, they, sorry, they, their site. How much it costs to, to um, staff and taxes and all these different things. Plus, places like Spotify still pay copyright because they have to pay. Um, of course they have to. They got sued like crazy. And um, they, they have I'm a sorry, bunch of copyrights. Including yeah, the mechanical rights. No, they're, they're good now. They're good now in terms of clearing stuff. But for a minute, when they came out, they were cards and stuff left, right, and center. But what, as they start getting bigger, they notice that, yeah, it wasn't worth the legal fees. Because trust me, way ain't cheap. For, for, so for I have so a question I would recommend for... That, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, just a quick recommendation that you have a tax accountant as a, a future guest, especially with like Vaughn because what you would see is that a lot of artists now are listing on some of those streaming platforms and when they get their their their, their royalties the funny thing is you just like say that and <laughs> you say that and I actually like have a question for you in tax but that's the right person I need to have a tax um <laughs> you know I mean I, I have general there are ways to avoid it right um but some tax accountants especially that specialize in international affairs would add significant value because there's things that you have to file, right? There's some certain tax treaties that our countries have signed on to and, and, and so on. But a lot of artists know what they want, along with what ECHO is bringing, is their accounting affairs. Because to go hire a CP, a tax accountant in the U.S. for the little bit of money that they're getting, it just, it, it's not cost, it, it could be cost prohibitive, so... I would suggest that's my future guest as you delve deep into this topic. I have a question for Dr. Noel Howell because you're a producer and a filmmaker yourself. And um, what are like what challenges that you have, if any, in the U.S. as we are about to wrap up? Um, what challenges you may have, um, even with the, the use of music or um, or anything, or what question you may have for Miss Mason? Um, herself as being an entertainment lawyer. First of all, I want to say congratulations on this program, and I do hope that this continues to be something that we can do, you know, on a regular. Um, it's very informational. Um, I know time is flying, so let me go straight directly to Miss Mason. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in New Jersey, so okay. I'll be kind of reaching out to you also at some point. My question is, though, is if, if you're in New Jersey, and you want to use, or I want to say you, you have your Caribbean music, right? Mm -hmm. in, in your movie or even in your, your video. Okay. And the person in, because most of the young artists, especially, they're not joining Echo or they're not joining anyone. Mm -hmm. How do you go about getting those rights? And if you use them, like, what, okay. are there any penalties? Because let's say there's a young guy singing and I don't know his name or I can't reach him and I just put mm -hmm. his music. Mm -hmm. Can I face a penalty in the U.S. even though the person is outside of the U.S.? Because my movie okay. will be distributed in the U.S. Your movie will not be distributed in the U.S. <laughs> Why? Because you have to clear the music, okay? So I had a client that had a dance competition series. And they were using a lot of popular music, okay? And so they were, we were doing a negative, we were doing a carriage deal. 
with the network. They're what happened is that when they were producing the whole their whole series, it was a reality show series. It's a dance series, right? So they were using they were just out. People were dancing to random music. They never had the license to the music, and they were using a lot of like, popular music. What happened when time came for them to get this distributed? You have to clear the copyrights because not these people don't want to get sued. You might be able to find the people, but they're not going to play it unless you could show with the Kyushi that you actually have clearance to every single piece of music. No distributor is going to touch it because they could get sued for copyright infringement. So that's what's gonna happen. So what he what happened ended up happening here, they were using so much popular music, it became cost prohibitive for them to go and get those licenses. They had to redub the entire show. They lost a bunch of footage too because they couldn't get it synchronized right um, in music, but then they had to use a that they already cleared the copyright for. So when you're doing a project unless you have a license for the music in your project, don't use that music because you're not gonna get distribution because distributors are risk averse and they're not gonna, dis you're not gonna be able to get a distribution deal without all the copyrights in your project being cleared. And that goes to trademarks too. All the intellectual property in your project before you get a distribution deal or else you're not gonna get one. Thank you, y'all. So y'all are here, right? So, and, um, so Vaughn, uh, seriously, I know a lot, I'm speaking on behalf of some of the young entertainments like Guy, and they, they need to really encourage young guys to, to get involved and, and know what's going on with their music, you know? Yeah, we do. Um, one, of my, one of my biggest pet peeves, um, I think we need not just a table of that we have here, but we need in this planning all the people that you do not business. I think if you want to go into the music of business, even as an artist, you need to see them first to see if you really want to do it. You need to do feasibility studies. Is there enough audience to do the, you know, in, 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 in the country in to support the kind of music you're doing? Is it going to be a business or is it going to be a hobby? How are you going to make your money from it? These are the questions they need to ask before they actually want to take on music as a business. And so things like copyright, trademarking and all that kind of stuff is things they need to figure out because if you're actually opening a business, these are things you need to know about, so they need to really see music as a business. They need to see their art as a business. All the time. I actually say that. I say that to artists here all the time, which is what I allude to when I say I do these strategy sessions all the time. Because I, after years of being in this business and teaching music and speaking on numerous panels, for now, when clients come to me, when artists come to me, most of the time, artists just like they like to create they don't do business so i actually came up with this thing i call a music business strategy session i have different ones i have a music business one i have an entertainment one a fashion one it works with whoever creative i'm working with right but the goal of that is and well since we're talking about music i'll go on the music front is literally i would send out a questionnaire it has on about 25 questions and based on the answers to those questions I can know exactly where these people are in, in the industry. Like how much do they understand about the business of music? I had a session with a guy who is a rapper and he, he, get, he was featured on someone else's track. It went gold. And his complaint to me was that he never saw a penny in royalties. And after I asked him a few questions, it's just like he could have never seen royalties because in the U.S. there's a specific way you have to do to actually collect your money in music or you'll never get money. Um, a lot of these artists, they jump up and they throw their music online and then they're like, yeah, I want it to go viral. Yeah, it would and you will not see a dime because you never step back and lay the foundation in which to build your music career on. Like if you hadn't affiliate with your PRO, if you didn't form a publishing company and I'm looking at the artists who are writing their own songs and singing their own songs. So if you didn't affiliate with the publisher and um, a PRO, if you didn't form a publishing company, if you didn't like tell the PRO what's in your catalog, yes, they don't. And I've had issues where even my client that I have now that has the music estate, 
her son, not her son, her husband had written a song like 20 years prior, last year. We, we were dealing with this last year. He had written a song, and then the original was in his catalog. Then it was remixed, and the remix had Shaka Khan on there, and then this other prolific composer guy that had scored a bunch of movies, and he was on the remix track. They never reported the remix track to their PRO. So for 20 years, the song got, and the mix was more popular than the original. And this happens a lot of times, okay? It happens a lot in music where the original, nobody knows about, and the remix is the most popular version. It's, so it's very important that you always have to update your catalog, and they didn't. So for 20 years, we were pirating this song because the remix was so popular that if you searched it online, there was like a million remix of the remix and the client wasn't seeing a dime of money and the PR couldn't collect royalties because they didn't even know that there was a remix. So 20 years later, put the song in the catalog. Go figure. And, the, and that only came up because we were dealing with a con someone in the Netherlands who actually found us and was trying to do the company. So they did, that's what I'm saying. Like, understand the, the music makes money here in the US. And probably into you, like, if you don't get it, and music is weird and how people get paid, because it's not like film, film is linear. You have a film project, you could have a pickup, a negative pickup deal a distro deal, you have a theatrical run, then you have ancillary run, you could have like a TV run off and all these other things. So you could kind of see how your money flows directly. In music, your money is all over the place. It's no like linear fashion, like in film. And music was designed in such a way that if you don't learn it, you never make money. I try to guide them and give them at least the, the foundation and the groundwork and then send them some, you know, hands out on sampling and creating their music legacies for, you know, like the steps you need to take in order to create your legacy and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's very important. If you don't do that, you'll never make money in music, point blank. It just won't happen. Kenny has any more questions because I know he himself is on, um, he's into music and I'm certain if he have any more. Um, but um i'm uh, yeah go ahead Kenny. Sure, jump in. yeah um this is for is it miss monroe mason mason monroe? mason, mason. Yes. Oh, yes mason yes uh, mason oh yeah <laughs> i just signed right behind your head <laughs> yes <laughs> sorry, sorry. All about the brand and that's my company <laughs> that is so sweet that is so sweet mason. okay so in for you um on your side because you're an entertainment lawyer right yes Right. So when it comes to um, hiring a entertainment lawyer, does that mm -hmm. law is that is that is that lawyer um, an employee or they or it's more like a contracted service? It's a contracted service. You're not and no and no lawyers are employee in, in, of any company unless they were exclusively for that company in house. Yes. So now we're we're our own people. You pay our fee. You're our clients, <laughs> like we're um, not your employees. And I have another question. Sure. Right, so, um, do you need to hire someone? Do you need to hire more than one entertainment lawyer? You need to get okay. And I like to tell people all the time: when people say they're an entertainment lawyer, make sure they actually know what they're doing. I've met way too many people who dabble in entertainment that are lawyers and claim they're entertainment lawyers and they have no idea what they're doing, all right, and give people really bad advice. You only literally need one entertainment lawyer. Well, for me, if I'm doing film, I don't do a particular area in film, which is financing, because when you finance films, you deal with securities. And most of you're financing a film project, you're, yeah, you're a securities lawyer. Um, some entertainment lawyers actually do financing, but uh, yeah, I, I don't keep up with this law, and that's why you have lawyers that specialize in securities and stuff, and they get high when the 
it excites them to call them up. But you only need the one entertainment lawyer. But you need that <laughs> lawyer to know. And some lawyer, some entertainment lawyers only do music. So they dub themselves music lawyers. Um, some only touch film. I know, I have some entertainment lawyers I know, and they would not touch music because it's way too complicated. They just can't touch it. But they do film. And for me, I, like, I'm an equal opposite presenter. <laughs> right? My clients are... Film people, music people, fashion people. I have a consultation next week with a jewelry designer. Um, you know, so my thing is that I've never, I made it my business to know a true entertainment lawyer so I could, you know, piggyback all of the genres, you know, be it film, TV, music, fashion photography, painters, you name it. I like it. if you shake for an entertainment purpose, like we represent you. So if you yourself as an artist that you know you want to cross genres, right? Which right now in this day, the lawyers who still say, I only do music, I only do film, they're kind of crazy. People, they try to act. To a good degree sometime, you know, they, they tend to be okay. Um, Jamie Fox artists that crosses over, and there are a couple artists cross over. When the film people try to sing, that's mostly a disaster because where you can teach <laughs> somebody to act, and if they do it long enough, they might be halfway decent. If you can't sing, you can't sing. So the true actors usually stay in their lane. Yeah. That's so, why I like to be a true entertainer. Right, right. So, I mean, I mean, like you said, it, it, I mean, one doesn't really need more than one um, yes. lawyer. You just need the um, right but one. Me, but, like, for instance, me as a Caribbean artist, being in, a Car yes. um, in Antigua, mm -hmm. um, do, I mean, that's, what, that's why I asked you the question in the first place, because, oh, you know, so when, you I, when I'm looking at, when I'm looking at, like, um, you know, crossing territories, like, you would definitely um, in one, state yeah. and out state, you know? Yeah, so you would need U.S. representation. So, in that yeah. instance, you would need more than one. Because your Antigua lawyer can't practice law here. Right. So they can, if there's deal representations being done in the U.S., your Antigua lawyer can't advise you on them. They have no idea how it works here. They might have some general understanding, but they are not there to advise you because they're not versed in U.S. law and how U.S. copyright law works. You get what I'm saying? So you would need local representation. Like you would need U.S. representation to cover you in the right. U.S. Because your Antigua lawyer, if they tell you they understand the nuances of U.S. copyright law, they're most likely lying. Because my fellow lawyers don't even understand copyright. It's one of those kind of areas of law that is niche. Um, most people could count on on how many entertainment lawyers they know. If I'm speaking to someone, they'll be like, oh, you're the first entertainment lawyer I ever met. You are that rare. Because that... Okay, so I have... Go on. So I have, sorry, I have one more question sure. before I take up any more time. Sure. Um, what's the cost in hiring a, a lawyer? I mean, an entertainment lawyer. <laughs> Good question. Everybody, everybody <laughs> has their own cost, man. Everybody have their own cause because I mean, you know, I I'm not even at the highest end of the spectrum, but I would like to say I'm comfortable where at where at what I charge based on the fact that I have been um, you know, been a lawyer for 15 years, exclusively doing entertainment for 13, and have a plethora of experiences to the point where when I was going to give up my practice and go, say I'm for other people, I was interviewing at Facebook Music, Sony, and all over the place. So the way I look at it, I am, you know, I'm good <laughs> at what I do. <laughs> and I totally charge my new and my worth. So, um, and I'll just, I'll put it out there. If you're thinking, like, for keep my, and right now, I do so many things, so I'm I am picky, and I gate keep my practice because in level in my career now that I'm like you have to be really serious, and I'm trying to, um, for me to even be bothered because 
if not, and I could be doing other things with my time, like my, my, um, check, but, um, keep her feet. My, that I kept dropping for a while, I sit down and pick my brain and get like all the experience. And if you're new, that you're not, you know, you're just coming into the game and here I am already a member of the Recording Academy, so I literally could nominate, um, to get nominated for a Grammy. Yeah, I'm not playing. Like, that's my fee to get in the door. How much I charge after that, it all depends on what instrument you're looking for. I have clients who pay me a retainer. You know, it's that kind of lovely service. It's clients, it's there are so clients who come and they just need, you know, something done. And then I charge them a flat fee. So it depends right. on the level. So of I, I must, I must ask this one last question. Um, yeah. um, the, the last one. one, the last one. You sure? Um, any food? I be put this. <laughs> I don't do free. Do I got free? That free ship sailed a long time ago. When I was starting out at my level, I don't have to do free because I don't necessarily need clients i need people who are trying to go places so i don't i, I don't do free I, i'm i'm not even sorry about it like i'll bust my ass to get to where i am <laughs> i was just so messing with you but no no i don't do free consultations it's it's not my jam and i've noticed and when i started out years ago i used to do those but the um and even contingency to get you established as an artist, get your deal, and then I get a cut. I think that ship sailed years ago. Big story, not because it's part, you know, I'm not being personal to you, Kenny. I'm just saying why I have this like policy. Let me tell you what the artist did. So I formed his companies, okay? His publishing and artist company did his distro deal. Do never pay me. And then you know what the dude ended up doing? A little too hard for him. And he and he went to nursing school. Come on. <laughs> oh, Michael, hell no. Okay, but on, on, on a related note, I have two questions. Oh. Uh, when you say you don't do free work, I, I so agree with you on this because, especially when it comes to music. That was our. We need to learn that everything costs money. Yeah. We have to invest. We Sponsoring it, I will insist that everybody pays at least a hundred dollars because they need to get that through their heads. Nothing yeah. in business is free. I think you have to invent me in from leaving Antigua to paying for college. I still see that damn student. It's okay. And just like over this, I have spent a ton of money just like get to the level I am in music. I mean. Yeah, yeah, I paid to get, you know, I spend money on those, but then it's the grabbies, it's okay. But I'm just saying, right, you have to, like, in any business and in any career endeavor, you have to be willing to actually put up that money to go where you want to be and get where you need to get. Like, the way how I tell clients all the time, listen, you're crying about, like, oh, some of them complain, oh, 500, oh, my God, that's so much, why? And I'm like, trust me. For that guy that album went gold and didn't see a penny, he should have found me way before he got to that point. He would have made more than the $500. You know what I'm saying? And you can't look back and collect royalties. The, um, the organizations up here only look back like nine months. So if you're talking about like years and years and years, you're floating in this bubble and forget finding it on the internet, you ain't gonna find it. Or it's gonna be so much you're gonna be overwhelmed. You really need to either go and take a class He'll come to me for an hour and then I point you in the right direction. That's my personal plan. Because <laughs> I'm shameless. What is that? I'm a businesswoman. Or you end up paying a publisher on the internet to publish your music. <laughs> and have no idea and still you're screwed because you have no idea what they're doing and they still could screw you over because you really don't know. And my whole thing is knowledge is power. You know, knowledge is power. You don't have to get to the level of knowledge that I am. You're just never going to. But I like to say you need to be informed. And at least afterwards, I am giving you stuff on sampling and building your legacy. And if you choose to read it, <laughs> then you'll be awake and aware and you wouldn't be getting screwed. 
generally speaking. Just say. All right. <laughs> Doc, you had something else you wanted to say? Because we, we have to... Yes. Mm -hmm. I know. Uh, I know. I mean, I'm going to contact a few people after. Um, okay. And then I hope you guys don't mind. I'll probably be getting you guys phone numbers and email from... No Fanta. problem. Um, the yeah, I was about to ask that as well. Uh, yeah. Yes. Right. Um, so yeah. Hey, doing the job, put... everyone on the thing. I'd just like to personally say thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, you know, let's keep let's keep this rolling, man. So I have one question, and sure, which I can is multitask. right, which is um, should extra cast consult with an entertainment lawyer? So people who are extras. Yes. Uh, what did what about what uh, for, for movie uh, for move for, for yeah film, I know for what the extras yeah. are but what what do they need the entertainment lawyer for just a sure question just, <laughs> just to protect themselves I mean in just in case of anything you know well it's, it's well they come to me based on if they get an extra agreement and it's so usually those things are like a pager too yeah you know um, so if it's and they're generally basic well. I shouldn't say basic because what's basic for me could be like the moon for other people. Um, if you get an, if as an extra, you get an agreement and you don't know, understand what's going on, then you come to me, but I don't see how much an extra, or you come to me because you're trying to strategize about your career move because okay. I'm all about the strategy. I just tell people in this game called entertainment, okay? You have to know, and I think we talked about this in the last three-hour marathon thing, right? right? Yeah. About leveraging experiences. So you could always clip that section and put up for people to hear about how I went about leveraging, you know, coming from Antigua, <laughs> you know, Cooksville, Great Storm area, you know, and rising to the level of where I am strutting down the red carpet going to the Grammys. And how did I make that leap from there or to like to London to the BAFTA TV Awards and to whatever, wherever I was and COVID is totally um, But how did I go from, you know, our small island to being at like that of entertainment in the US where when we're sitting out and when I left Antigua, I didn't left Antigua with the intention of being an entertainment, left Antigua with the intention of being a lawyer and figure out entertainment while in law school. But I went from that to my leveraging and not strategy, right? You have to have a, as an artist, you have to have a strategy. If you want to rise to the top of the game, you literally have, it's like, you have to strategize. I strategize all the time about where I want to be in entertainment, I planned out a strategy of how I was going to get where I am now. And I'm already working on my strategy to see, okay, who else do I want to hook up? Maybe the television academy. So I'll sit down and I'll plan out a strategy of how I'm going to get over there and get it, you know, accepted and admitted like I am with the British Academy or the recorded academy. And in order to be successful in entertainment, you strategize. So an extra coming to me now would be okay you're an extra but it's all right where where do you see yourself what do you want to be okay and then i'll strategize with them about okay how can you get there what you need to get there and that's how you know that's how we do it and that's how it works so that's the only way i could see the need for um an extra would want to thank you all so much for coming thank you Vaughn. Okay, because that's honestly that thing about echo it was a bit I was I myself too didn't understand, but I understand better now. And um, Dr. Martin has um, privately said that he's learned even a lot more as well too. So we're really grateful for your presence and everyone that joined. All right, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. You are most thank welcome you. there. And until next time, <laughs> peace, people. Peace. Stay safe. Stay well. And you know. Much success to y'all and all your endeavors. You too, Kate. I mean, I just want to say thanks, fans, was for inviting me on this. I'm not only an artist, but I'm as, I'm also a record label owner. Okay. Right? Awesome. Yeah, so. And uh, people, I'm gonna say peace and and stay safe. God bless. Take care.